Well, thank Thank you, Malou. Thank you, um, obviously, to Haven for inviting me to this Haven halftime for lunch. Um, I've been a Haven member since the beginning. I got to walk the space with Felicia when it was still under construction and see all the amazing things that um, this community would become. And um, I'm really happy to be part of it. So without further ado, we can jump into um some of the website trends for the remainder of the year and obviously going into 2024. Uh, just some quick notes about me. Um, so I started Digital Retail Partners in 2015. Um, we have uh, a small but mighty team. We've got about 12 full-time employees that uh, some of which are based out of Haven. So you may have already met some of them. Um, and we primarily focus on e-commerce and website development and design. We also have a full service marketing team as well. Um, we are a Forbes agency council, uh, part of the Forbes agency council. Um, we also are HubSpot experts, Shopify experts. We work on Klaviyo and um, we do traditional design as well. So that's just a little bit about what we do. And jumping into it, um, so I'm a very tactical person. I I uh, will make sure that everybody gets a copy of this deck after the presentation. Um, but in terms of what I'm sharing, um, you'll see that there's links in here. There are very specific um, objectives and things that you can use in your day-to-day -day practices for your own business and your website. So. Um, I didn't uh, go crazy on visuals as I really wanted you to have something that you could work from and use as a tool for the future. So what I have seen as the, the top five e-commerce trends in 2023, and I've, obviously there's more than five out there, but I'm really trying to give you things that may be unique, may be a little bit different than what you're seeing in your day-to-day. -day. And this is very specific, obviously, for e-commerce. Um, so the first one is, is that we're seeing a lot with businesses going back to referrals and also really focusing on ramping up their reviews. Um, as you all know, paid media, paid ads, it's very expensive. <laughs> Cost per acquisition and just being in the, in the digital media space, um, sometimes depending on what type of product you sell or business you have, it just doesn't work. So we really are focusing on our clients, ramping up their customer reviews. 76% of consumers read reviews. They make their decision, their buying decisions on it. So, um, and referral referrals as well, not just from, you know, customers, but also looking at what those partnerships can be with other brands, influencers, nonprofits. So it's, that kind of leads into number two, which is exploring joint partnerships. Um, these are opportunities for quick wins to expand your audience with like-minded businesses or individuals. Um, again, you know, we're, we are seeing e-commerce businesses step away from the paid media um, or taking budget from paid media digital ad space and pushing it more towards their partnerships with other businesses or individuals. Number three, is a uh it it's been around for a while but an even bigger push for an omni-channel approach for e-com businesses um really knowing that consumers are shopping they're starting their customer journey on one platform and they're potentially finishing on another um great example of this is everybody probably got their uh amazon catalogs in october um but does anybody actually order through the catalog? No, they go to Amazon to order the items. So utilizing, you know, an omni-channel approach such as direct mail is a great return on your investment. Um, it really focuses on hitting your customer in multiple touch points and places. Personalized relevancy. So this is an interesting one that I'm seeing more of. Um, definitely our clients and their customers greatly appreciate it when companies recommend products 
to them specifically that are on promotion and not really relying on the idea of something being on, on sale here, but that you're actually using your first party data, your purchase information for that customer, what they're interested in, what may appeal to them to promote to them. So if you know that previously a customer has bought a certain widget or an item and you want to offer it to them now on sale, but you know that they've obviously previously purchased it, this is a great way to build loyalty and also to utilize that purchase information. So really looking at personalized relevancy to that customer. And the number five trend, which is really exciting, especially for those that, you know, their businesses may be purpose-driven or built around sustainability is that the resale market is surging. You can see that companies like Lululemon or J. Crew, they have um, very specific programs that, you know, they're, they're asking their customers to um, send back, you know, worn clothing, they're giving credits for those. And then, you know, they're looking also at some third party programs like Thread Up, where they're getting merchandise credit. So they're recycling the clothing, they are reselling the clothing. We have a um, a client in the maternity space that is doing this now with um, not worn clothing, but clothing that was returned and not worn. And they're selling it at, you know, a 20%, 30% discount just because it left their warehouse. Um, this is for undergarments. So it is a little bit of one of those items that, you know, they're they're not really reselling typically, but instead of just donating it or obviously throwing it in the trash, they're getting, um, you know, that resale potential out of it. So some great ideas there. The next topic that I thought would be really helpful would be speed optimizations. Um, so we websites in general, I think everybody at this point knows that site speed is important. It's not just important to the customer experience, but, you know, your SEO value and what Google ranks you on is considering speed as one of the factors that has been around for a couple of years now. Um, also, you know, just generally mobile first is um, very important for speed. So there's a link up at the top, which um, is it's called Lighthouse. This is the Google built-in tool for testing your web page speed you can use in Chrome. I highly recommend not just testing your homepage, but um, testing multiple pages on your website, highly traffic and highly visited pages on your website to get an idea as to where you fall in the speed ranking. And then also looking at what their recommendations are for increasing your speed. So um, I gave a couple of tips in here. They're not a, um, from a developer point of view, because obviously I'm sure no one on the call is a developer, um, but I wanted to give very specific and tactical items that you can do to increase your site speed outside of obviously code. Um, so the first would be obviously focusing on mobile browsing really looking at what that experience is. In some platforms, there is an opportunity to hide content on mobile that you may feature on desktop that really just doesn't you know, serve a purpose. It makes the page too long. So looking into ways that you can really focus on your mobile first design. I also recommend um, just generally, we're, we're moving towards more simplified design cleaner design that's faster. Um, so limit the use of heavy design elements, stick to the essentials. I'm seeing a lot more one-page websites um, and we're getting requests for one-page websites that, you know, you don't have to have 40 pages on your site to sell, you know, one product. Sometimes obviously that's not the case if you have a big catalog of items, but really looking at how you simplify your user journey and experience. Um, the other item I recommend is looking at adaptive assets. So these are um, vector formats, um, SVG files um, that, you know, are based on obviously vector artwork as opposed to JPEGs and PNGs. I also recommend looking at your fonts. 
Surprisingly, web fonts can slow down your site. So, you know, depending on how many fonts you have on a site, how you set up your, your um, style sheets, really looking at what you need on your site to get the job done so that you don't have anything extra on there in terms of, you know, additional character sets. And then the last item is limiting the use of animations. Um, I think animations are great to add visual interest, but they do slow your site down. So um, I'm going to go into this in a little more detail in, when I get to the ADA optimizations, but under no circumstances should you use GIFs on your website. Um, they are not ADA compliant. They usually take up a ton of space. Um, I don't think most people can get a good GIF under one megabyte, and that's really what you're shooting for for image size. So if you feel compelled or like that you need something on your site that's an animation, make sure it's a video file and that you're properly hosting it from a, um, a video player uh, like YouTube or Vimeo. Some of the other tips um, for e-commerce brands would be, this is the time to take advantage of AI and AR. Um, and I put a ton of links in here that you can use, but um, we've been playing around obviously with AI for a little while. There are programs out there, you know, obviously I'm sure everyone's seen it on Facebook that, you know, you can create your own headshot. Well, you can do the same thing with your products. So if you've got silhouetted product images, you can use AI to have your, you know, AI model wear your product. I have tried out this link. It's $29 a month. Um, you can get several poses out of the models. It's not perfect. You have to play around with it, but there are, um, there's definitely a push, obviously, for great visuals on e-commerce sites, and this is an opportunity to use that. Um, I also highly recommend really not just e-com sites, but any professional service-based businesses also looking into chatbots. Um, so it used to be, you know, you had to be a bigger business if you were going to utilize a chatbot, but because of AI and technology and the way that it's, in, it's matured, smaller businesses can take advantage of this. So giving the experience that a customer is talking to someone, I think is really valuable, um, you know, with the ability to load user data into these AI chatbots, you can really create individual individualized, you know, experiences or answer questions, or at least give the, give the opportunity to the customer to, um, you know, search for something by asking a question as opposed to looking directly at a search page. Um, there are a couple apps that we in particular use, one that's free, it's called Drift. Um, it's a great little chat bot. And then I've also put this link in the, um, in the deck, which gives you a lot of other uh, ideas as to how you can use chatbots for your business. And then the last um, quick win for AI or AR is augmented reality experiences, specifically for Shopify. Um, I don't know how many Shopify businesses or we have on this uh, call, but um, Shopify has a native built-in AR experience. Um, I put the link down at the bottom there as well. It is not something you have to pay extra for. It's not an app. It is a little snippet of code that you can put on your website. And if you have the particular um, correct, you know, 3D files, you can create an AR experience. Um, we're doing this for a couple of our clients now that create, you know, custom furniture. They already happen to have CAD files, makes it really easy to you know, render a piece of furniture in someone's room just by having their iPhone and being able to, you know, place it in that room. So looking at you know VR as a tool for your website is definitely something you're going to be seeing over the next year if you're not already um, experiencing that. And then the last topic that I wanted to bring up, and I do again have some links in here for you is ADA compliance. Um, I get asked a lot about this from our clients and it is a real thing. 
Um, so ADA is the um, American Disabilities Act, which uh, websites in general have really come under a lot of scrutiny lately. Um, the idea is that your website should be accessible to everyone, um, even those with, you know, uh, obviously disabilities. So um, there are law firms out there that you know, are finding there's some quick wins to suing um, smaller businesses. It used to be the big box retailers that were getting hit with these lawsuits, but because they learned their lesson and they're now fixing their website and they obviously have robust legal teams, it really does make it harder for those law firms to carry out lawsuits with bigger retailers. So we're seeing a lot of smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses being sued over ADA compliance. Um, I know a lot of people try to put a patch on their website by using a little widget that has like a screen reader or it lets you increase the size of your font. Uh, unfortunately, as much as those do help increase the experience for those that are disabled, it doesn't make your website compliant. Um, so I do recommend a couple of things that, you know, you should be doing, which is, um, there's a validator tool. I did put a link in here that you can run your site up through. There's two other links that I gave you wave by web aim and Google lighthouse. In addition, the same link that you would use for your speed ranking. If you already have it installed, all you have to do is press F12 in Chrome. It will open the Lighthouse tab. These tools will give you the exact list of the majority of accessibility barriers on your website. And I highly recommend, even if it seems like Greek to you, to at least run those reports on your site to get an idea as to where you stand for ADA compliance. If you have a score of 90 or higher on Google Lighthouse, you are in really good shape and it's unlikely that you would be potentially sued. Um, anything lower than a 90 does start to, you know, give people some, some worries about the things that you could be flagged for. So um, again, some other tips was the GIFs cause scanning tools and screen reading, screen reading software to misbehave. So I highly recommend that you avoid GIFs under any um, circumstances on your website. People used to use them to make animations, but right now the only real safe um, animated element is using a video and uh, making sure you're using a video element with all of the controls as possible. Um, there's a lot of questions I get about audio and video. Um, audio that is autoplay is not ADA compliant. Um, so really, you know, if you do have audio in a video, you need to give the um, user full control to be able to turn that video, turn that audio up, down, off, mute it, whatever they need to do. The other um, item to look out for is table elements. So um, I know this one may seem I like why what what is a table element, but tables used to be popular in coding websites uh, many years ago. Um, they are no longer used, but in, sometimes they creep into code. Um, you really want to use your CSS to lay out all content and. Um, Again, just avoiding table elements. If you're copying code from another website, you know, looking for that table element and making sure you can run it through your validator tool to make sure that it's, um, it's you know, uh, current of the day code. Um, iframe elements. So um, an iframe element obviously is when you're like embedding you know, a YouTube video or embedding any other kind of um, third-party code into your website, highly recommend that you give all of your iframe elements a title attribute. The title attribute is what the screen readers use to basically explain what the element is that's embedded. So in this case, this example says iframe title equals YouTube video. That is a compliant um element because it's explaining to the user what that what that uh, particular video is. 
even better would be to give a more full explanation of what the video is about. And in general, um, I get this asked a lot about how hyperlinks should be set up, but links in general, um, they need to be descriptive. So a lot of e-com websites, they'll just have a button, you know, buttons all down the homepage that say shop now, shop now, shop now. Unfortunately, a screen reader, you know, reading out to a customer shop now, that is really not enough information. There's not enough context there. So the idea is that you want to have very specific, you know, um, calls to action on any of your hyperlinks or buttons. So shop the new arrivals collection would be considered an ADA compliant um, call to action or link. Um, you also want to avoid making your links duplicative if they're going to different destinations. So for example, if you have three blogs on the bottom of your homepage and each of those blogs links say, read more, read more, read more, what you would want to do is change that to say, read blog one or read blog about, um, you know, Thanksgiving. You want to be very specific so that the, the call to action actually matches back to the hyperlink. Um, and there's some additional tips in here for you as well. And then last but not least, this is probably an easy one, but you wanna make sure all of your images always have an alt attribute. Um, that is again, what the screen readers use for explaining to um, a blind person what they're looking or what they are, what they would be seeing on the screen. And um, all attributes should be very much set up like you would be, you know, talking out a phrase. So um, you, it shouldn't be um, uh, like uh, broken sentences. It should be, you know, green sweater made from wool would be a very good alt attribute. It has the description and it it's read as if it's, you know, a sentence. Um, you don't need hyphens. You can literally just write it out like you would a sentence. All right. And that that's everything I put together. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to pull, uh, I'm going to have this deck sent out to everybody so you can get access to all these links. And I guess we can open it up for questions. Thanks, Deb. This is great. I see you have um, any questions. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, um, when you talked about um, partnerships, web partnerships, um, can you give some examples of what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think a great example would be we have a couple of our clients now that have very similar audiences. Um, one's a clothing brand, one's a skincare brand, and one is a children's brand. Um, but in general, they're, you know, they have like very similar audiences on their social media. Um, so joining them up to do giveaways, um, you know, introducing their audiences to these other brands by featuring them in an email or a and a on their website, and then vice versa, you know, doing the same thing is, comes across as very organic um, to your customers. So those are just <clears throat> some quick ideas how you can work with other businesses. Obviously, if you're a clothing brand, you don't want to necessarily promote another clothing brand, but I think if it's something you don't sell, there's an opportunity there to, you know, feature them in a blog post, feature them in a gift guide, things that make sense for your business. And do you have any examples on um, uh, partnerships with nonprofits? Um, like working with like multiple nonprofits. We uh, in your in the the slide uh, you listed uh, that partnerships with nonprofits is one of the things to think about. So I was curious what that meant. Oh yes, so I think obviously with Giving Tuesday coming up, Giving Tuesday is the day after Cyber Monday. A lot of our brands, um, we will be running campaigns for them where they are going to donate. Um, you know, 
a portion of, of profits or feature a nonprofit. Um, and I think, again, that's a great way to not only do good, but, um, you know, if you're a regional based business, you can find other regional based nonprofits. Some of the larger ones sometimes can be tougher to work with, but getting them to amplify, you know, a campaign that you might have on social media or sending out an email blast on behalf of um, uh, the nonprofit. I know a lot of our clients also donate goods to silent auctions in order to be featured um, there. If it's a specific, you know, product that they're gifting to a silent auction, it's a great way to ampl amplify your brand by utilizing a nonprofit. I have a question. It's Melissa Hollick. So um, you talked about the one page website. So is that one screen or would you scroll down or have tabs or it's just one screen? Yeah. So um, it depends on how, uh, how many pages you really do need, but You'll see, um, yeah, sometimes you'll go to a site, there'll be a navigation up at the top, you click on it, and it's called a jump link, and it jumps you down to the section on that page where um, the content, obviously, they're interested in would be. You know, you don't, you don't want to have a page that gets too long, where all of a sudden, the when it jumps down, you know, you're scrolling, 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 but right. um, we are seeing a lot more of those one page sort of um sites that are using jump links if again if if all of the content can live on one page um it just depends on how that works on a mobile device because mm -hmm. um again if it's for mobile optimization you know people like to scroll but you don't want to have too much scrolling um but that's typically what we're referring to when we say a one page site okay thank you mm -hmm. that's quite a good question about those uh, one-page websites, do you think that's going to impact the SEO as, as to having a normal page with five different tabs as far as SEO goes? So technically, depending on how you set it up, each section can actually be a separate page. Um, so you you would be getting multiple pages indexed by Google, not just a home page. Um, and also, you could have other pages in the background that are being indexed by Google, Google for SEO, but not necessarily part of the navigation. So, again, it really depends on, you know, what you're selling or what your business is about. It doesn't work for everybody, but if, you know, you have a very simple product or you have a professional service-based business where you, you know, you don't need a lot of pages, um, you know, I think we're seeing we're seeing businesses transition back to simpler websites. Hmm. Any other questions in line or here? I, I think that I'm I and I'm happy to answer. I know I talked a little bit about Shopify because that's really our, I would say 90% of our clients are on Shopify, but we do work in other platforms as well. Um, WordPress, Squarespace, uh, we build custom sites. So it doesn't necessarily have to be straight e-commerce related. I'm, I'm happy to answer anything else that's may be a different platform. Okay, that's, sounds good. Well, if, you know, if we have no more further questions, then I think, uh, we thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Marie, Melissa, Sonny, Eric, everyone else for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you at our next Haven Halftime. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll make sure you get the deck. Yeah, sure. We'll send it over. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.